It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is to the Acting Premier. Women fleeing domestic violence or surviving a sexual assault desperately need a place to turn when they're looking for help. Ontario's Coalition of Rape Crisis Centres has been left waiting for funding that they have been anticipating for months. Yep. They have been told it's on pause. How long is this pause going to take, Speaker? The Deputy Premier. To the Attorney General. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, t through you to the Leader of the Opposition. As uh, I said yes, last week in this House, we take the issue of women fleeing violence very seriously, and, we've the, and the funding necessary is something that we are looking at very closely. We don't want to rush it. We want to make sure that we are providing the appropriate services across our government to support women and who are fleeing violence to make sure that they get out of those situations and they get the, the services that they need. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, perhaps the government side doesn't know that women fleeing violence can't put their lives on pause. The government seems uninterested in providing support to women who desperately need it. But on some issues, the money flows very easily, Speaker. Last week, the Premier announced that he would be giving his former campaign tour director a plum posting in Washington and a $75,000 a year raise. Can the, act can the acting Premier explain why women should wait when he didn't pause to hand a friend $75,000? Deputy Premier, Attorney General, Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, we have been working since June 7th, since we were elected, to find ways to address the issues of concerns across this province. I have been working closely with my colleague, the Minister of Women and Violence Against and, and Children, to make sure that we are providing the supports that, that they need. The organizations that have been funded provide important services, and we recognize that. But as you know, we were left with a legacy of deficit and debt from the previous government, and so we need to make sure that we provide funding in a sustainable way to the people in this province who need it, and that is exactly what we are doing. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Final supplementary. Well, I certainly don't call, recall this government talking about putting women at further risk of sexual assault in their campaign speaker. Oh. We're getting a clearer sense, however, of exactly where this government's priorities lie. When women seeking support after sexual assault are told to wait and see if the counselling support they need is going to get funded, while the government strips them of their right to take time off work and demand, dismantles the programs designed to help them, Order. for these women, the cupboard is bare, Speaker. But when Don't it comes to funding a patronage, patronage post for well-connected buddies of the Premier, this government can't move fast enough. How does the acting Premier justify this? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Well, I reject the premise. We have been working non-stop since we were elected to provide the support. domestic violence are supported by this government and will continue to be supported by this government in a sustainable way. And we are looking across our government to make sure that we provide sustainable ways to do that, unlike the previous government that is setting people up for supports that are un un non-sustainable, and so we are working to do so in an efficient and effective way. Thank you. Start the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker, my next question is also for the Acting Premier, but I could say that we do agree with what the Attorney General just said. They have been working non stop to cut funding to the most vulnerable Ontarians that live in our province. That's what they've been doing, Speaker. Already, already Ontarians have seen services and programs that they need cut by this government, and it seems that even the police that keep our community safe aren't immune from this government's cuts. Can the acting premier confirm that her government has pressed the pause button on provincial grants that police forces were relying on for their budgets? Deputy Premier. 
Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've said in the past, the number one priority for us is to ensure public safety. And as you may know, the government continues to review expenditures in light of the government's fiscal state. This will allow our government for the people to inform service delivery planning as part of a multi-year planning process. As such, disbursement of funds under my ministry's grant programs are currently on hold. However, we will continue to work with our public safety partners to ensure they have the tools necessary to do their jobs both safely and effectively. Here, here, here. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, Kingston police say, and I quote, all bets are off if they don't receive the provincial grants they were expecting this year, but they've been told this government has pressed pause, pause on grants that support programs like crisis outreach and support teams that pair frontline police officers with mental health professionals yeah, wow. to go to calls where somebody may be in mental health distress. Now, those grants are in doubt and police force budgets are in jeopardy. Can the acting premier explain why police Police and people in mental health crisis are facing cuts. Minister of Community Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've stated from uh, the very beginning, one of the things that we're looking at is ensuring that there is an integrated approach to policing. And one of the things that we are looking at, one of the things that I've done, as has I've gone around the province and had the opportunity to sit in different vehicles, including with Hamilton Police, with Toronto Police. And in each of these different situations, I had the opportunity to see the Coast team at work, to see the different types of strategies that are in place. These are things that this government fully supports, is funding, and will continue to fund going forward. One of the things that we are keen on doing is ensuring that we have proactive policing, policing that will provide supports to individuals before they get into trouble by having them inserted, embedded within Response. the school system, yep. and also to make sure that they are part of the safety network that we have working throughout the whole province. Yeah, 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 yeah. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, once again, this is about priorities. This is about priorities. When it comes to funding for local police services and grants that help people who are in mental health crisis, the cupboard is absolutely big. But when it comes to jobs for the acting premier's friends and conservative insiders, the sky seems to be the limit. How can the acting premier tell police that the cupboard is bare when they're funding 70, rather handing $75,000 of pay hikes to the premier's friends? Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we've said time and time again, public safety is a concern to this government. One of the things that we have done is we've invested a lot of time and a lot of energy across the board, from the Ministry of Education to the Ministry of Health to housing to policing. And what we've determined is that what needs to take place is an integrated approach both to mental health and to how the government operates. Unlike the past where empty promises have been made, this government is taking steps to ensure that a fiscally responsible plan is in place and we're able to provide services not only during the period of time where policing may be involved, but prior to that. Being proactive is something that this government is doing in a responsible way to ensure that the citizens of this province are taken care of and that we live in a much more balanced and secure way and fiscally responsible, which is something a lot of people seem to forget about in this house. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is uh, again for the Acting Premier. Let's look at another support that this government is pulling. Parent, uh, parents volunteer thousands of hours in our schools every year, working hard to make uh, a better school system for their kids. Last year, they organized thousands of events across the province to help other parents uh, deal with everything from cyber uh, stalking and peer pressure to helping their kids be successful in math and science. Why has the government cut the funding these parents rely on, Speaker? Deputy Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would suggest that the entire Ontario government on this side of the House 
would strongly and recommend, and the other side, yes, absolutely, respectfully recommend to this Leader of Opposition and her entire party that they stop fear-mongering. We are doing a line-by-line -line audit, and we're making sure that we are on track in making proper investments that are going to Opposition return to return on investment that is going to benefit parents and it's going to benefit students and ultimately our overall learning environment in the classroom. We have had enough of the nonsense coming from that side of the House. We're being respectful of taxpayer dollars, and we are going to get it right after the mess that we had to endure after after 15 Spons. years of mismanagement. Thank you very much. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, well, you know what? Across Ontario, we're hearing from people affected by the cuts from this government, uh, and the, prim uh, the minister can make whatever kind of uh, sticks and stones kind of comments that she wants. But we're doing our job, Speaker. We're doing our jobs for the people of Ontario. From parents who have lost programs that help them teach kids and keep them safe, to people who provide counselling and support to survivors of sexual assault, to police who are on the front lines of Ontario's mental health crisis, they are seeing cuts and pauses. There's no way that the government can pretend that's not happening. But if you're a friend of the Premier, this government can't move fast enough to hand you a $75,000 pay hike. What message does the Acting Premier think that that sends? to the people of Ontario. Minister of Education. So thank you very much, Speaker, and I'm pleased to stand on behalf of our government to, to absolutely reject the premise that this leader of the opposition is trying hasn't to been any. portray, because there hasn't been any. And I think Ontarians across this province are going to be actually respecting the thoughtful manner in which our President of the Treasury Board, our Minister of Finance, our entire Cabinet and ultimately our entire caucus is right. moving forward in respecting tax Taxpayer dollars. Do you know the party with the taxpayer dollars is over after 15 years of absolute waste? This government's going to get it right. We're going to take our time to do it. Thank you very much. Next question, member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. We've made it very clear that our focus is on ensuring hardworking people are not held back by unnecessary taxes, taxes that the Green Party, the NDP and the federal government have made clear that they agree with. Shamefully. These taxes will impact Ontario's hardworking families in more than just one way. Just this past Friday, the National Airlines Council of Canada sent a letter indicating that a price on carbon could result in increased cost to flights and in turn pushing jobs into the United States. Can the minister explain to us how the removal of the cap and trade carbon tax will in turn help the families of Ontario? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the, uh, to the member from Etobicoke Centre, and thank you for the question. Um, as she mentioned and has been mentioned, this government has made a priority about affordability for Ontario families. The members of the NDP and the Green Party have called for a $150 a ton carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker what that means is $0.35 cents a litre. 35 cents a liter increase or $216 per month in natural gas prices. Both the NDP and the Green Party uh, ran on the idea that people weren't taxed enough. We actually believe that Ontario families are taxed too much. Eliminating cap and trade will put $260 back in the pockets of Ontario families. Our government has promised this. It'll be true to our word. We will implement a made in Ontario solution around climate change, one that balances a healthy economy, a healthy environment, and doesn't punish Ontario families. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for his response and back to the minister again. It is no surprise that the man-made global problem of climate change threatens the beauty that we so often take for granted. This summer, we saw increased for forest fires and storms resulting in floods and power outages. 
Speaker, Ontario is blessed with magnificent forests, lakes, and rivers. Those of us who call Ontario home can ask for a better place to live, work, and raise a family. The quality of life enjoyed by our people as well as the success of our businesses depends on having clean air to breathe, safe water to drink, and well-protected lands and parks. Can the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks explain what his Made in Ontario plan will focus on? Great job. Yeah. Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, um, climate change does present a significant risk, and we are, we are addressing it. We also need to make sure that we have a plan in place for clean air, clean water, and clean land. This is why we're committed to climate change, but also in the context of a balanced plan that protects the economy while it protects the environment. Mr. Speaker, uh, there's now consultation open, has been for a week, at www.ontario.ca backslash climate change, where we are getting feedback from Ontarians, how to ensure we have a prosperous economy, but also ensure that we tackle this important problem. And this fall, we'll present our balanced plan, a plan that deals with clean air, deals with clean water, deals with clean lands, addresses climate change, appreciates that Ontario have made great commitments, but will still do more, but doesn't punish Ontario families, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. For months, experts, healthcare professionals, frontline harm reduction workers have said the evidence is clear overdose prevention sites save lives. Now, after an estimated 200 deaths since the unnecessary review started, the government has finally announced that they will allow overdose prevention to continue to operate in Ontario. However, the government is capping the number of sites to 21, which allows no new sites to open. Can the minister explain why there is a hard cap of 21 sites? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I, I am very pleased to have made the announcement today that the uh, government has decided to proceed with consumption and treatment centres that it will run across the province. This is something that the previous government did not do. They were trying to prevent overdose deaths, of course, but they were doing nothing to get people into treatment and rehabilitation. Treatment and rehabilitation is the ultimate goal. But I think there is also a, a, an amount of money that can spend. We are going to spend $331.3 million on these treatment sites. But I think it also needs to be remembered that this is one step along the treatment process. We are also going to spend $3.8 billion to create a comprehensive and coordinated mental health and addictions program, which is going to mean that we are going to need more detox Response. beds, more mental health services housing and all of the other services that are necessary. So this is one piece in a very big picture. Supplementary. Back to the minister. There are 18 sites currently operating in Ontario and three sites in Parkdale, in Thunder Bay and St. Catharines that were on pause. That's 21 sites already. Cities like Thunder Bay, which had their sanctioned site paused, had applied for a second site to open over the summer because evidence shows that they have the highest overdose rate in the entire province. Is the minister prepared to look at evidence for the need for new sites as they emerge? Minister. Currently, 18 sites open. They will all be able to apply under the new criteria as uh, consumption and treatment centres. There are the three sites that were paused. You're absolutely correct. In Thunder Bay, in St. Catharines, and in Parkdale, they will all be allowed to open as they submit their applications. Other areas may also submit applications as well, but the determination is going to be made on do they meet the criteria, first of all, is there a need in the community, where the location of other services are, and the ability of those centres to provide the wraparound services that people are going support. to need, because it's not just just a question of having a safe injection site to prevent overdoses. That is very important. But it's also about having the access Response. to detox beds, the mental health and addiction services, right. yeah. the housing, the employment yeah. services, yeah. all of those yeah. other yeah. services yeah. that people need. That will be taken out. Stop the clock.
Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services. I've been overwhelmed by the sheer volume of people who have reached out to me concerned about our ability to keep our communities safe. Individuals in foreign prisons are set to return to this province after fighting for ISIS and other terrorist organizations. Justin Trudeau's failure is not acceptable. We cannot stand by while convicted terrorists are set to return to Ontario and enjoy all of the privileges of this province. Terrorists who commit barbaric violence do not deserve to be welcomed with a tray of milk and cookies from Justin Trudeau. Minister, could you please update the members of this legislature on what our government for the people is doing to send a message to address these indefensible crimes? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my, and commend the member from Peterborough Kawartha for doing what is right and taking the necessary steps to ensure that the Terrorist Ac Activity Sanctions Act is brought before this legislature. Those who choose to leave our country and this great province to take up arms against our men and women in uniform, civilian populations and our allies in no way deserve to be welcomed back to this province with open arms. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, the federal government has failed to, do, to act or to do what they should be doing, and our government, for the people, is taking real action and delivering on our promises to enhance and restore public safety throughout this great province. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, I thank the minister for his response. The people of this great province must know that our government is listening and we're working hard to enhance and restore public safety. Speaker, Justin Trudeau's government is not providing the safety and security that Ontarians expect. Those who commit indefensible, heinous crimes deserve to be severely punished. The Trudeau government is not acting. Far too many Ontarians are concerned for their safety and the safety of their families. To the minister, could you please explain the steps that our government for the people is taking to keep our communities safe from those who are willingly choosing to commit barbaric crimes? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for this important question. Mr. Speaker, the people of this great province are fed up, and they deserve to know that their government will not let convicted terrorists walk around freely without any consequences. These criminals do not deserve to be provided with the same privileges law-abiding Ontarians, and, our government is, and accordingly, our government is taking action that is required to ensure these individuals are appropriately punished. Our government for the people remains committed to keeping our community safe, and we will continue to be clear in our message that there will be consequences for those who choose to leave Ontario to commit indefensible crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kiewetanong. Um, this question is to the Minister of Energy. Uh, speaker, uh, several weeks ago, I stood in this house to remark the, uh, about the, uh, the tragic suicide of a 13-year-old uh, Carlina Kamenowadman from Bearskin Lake. I mentioned uh, how Carlina and her family had gone over seven years, seven years, without running water or electricity in their home. The state of affairs uh, that would uh, outrage anyone if this happened to them or their family. Ontario Hydro Remotes had made a decision to cut the electricity to Carlina's family for reasons beyond their control. So, Speaker, I am left to wonder where else in this province would Ontario Hydro 
be allowed to get away with such, such actions as this. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the honourable member's question. Of course, we're working on a comprehensive plan to ensure that all of Northern Ontario, all of Ontario, but frankly, Northern Ontario, if I may, has a the kind of reliable energy system uh, that serves both families and isolated and remote communities as well as existing industries that we can be competitive, that we have an opportunity to ensure that during the harshest of temperatures, the coldest of winters, families and businesses can continue to operate with a safe, contiguous electricity system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, Ontario Hydro uh, Remotes uh, currently operates 21, 24 flying First Nations communities in Northern Ontario, but clearly something is not working. One solution that may be uh, the Wateniganiab uh, transmission project. Wateniganiab means line that brings light. A project of 22 First Nations that will connect 17 remote First Nations uh, communities that still reliant on diesel fuel for power. Better lives and more opportunity for the youth, for the for north, for north, north, is something I believe all members in this house can support, so that all indigenous, uh, other indigenous youth will not have to grow up the, the way Carlina did. So, Speaker, I ask the Premier and the Minister of Energy and, the, and the Indigenous Affairs, will they commit today Question. to support the Watte Power Project? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you. After more than eight years of my life living and working in these isolated communities and seeing firsthand the unreliability of diesel, certainly the costs and the environmental consequences of it, there is no question that a comprehensive plan for energy transmission throughout Northern Ontario, particularly in Northwestern Ontario, as the member points out, more than 25 isolated communities have an incredible opportunity. It isn't just about energy transmission, it's about bundles for technology, it's about roadways. I don't think anything uh, could be more important than when we look at north-south corridors, east-west corridors, east-west ties, we ensure moving forward that all of our communities, including the isolated and remote communities, that uh, rely on sources of energy that uh, must change over the course of time, didn't over more than 15 years, as we say in Northern Ontario, the decade and a half of darkness will changed under this government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Top clock. Start the clock. The member for Orléans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the minister responsible for women's issues. Services from sexual assault centers, also known as uh, rape crisis centers. And as of today, there's been no increase in funding to address that demand. As many women have stood up in this chamber before me, I would like to acknowledge their bravery and say, I stand with you and I believe you. Less than 10% of victims report their sexual assault to police. The 90% who don't go to the police are those who are often forgotten in this equation. Under the former government, we promised a 33 per cent funding increase for these centres that would provide life-saving services for those who have experienced sexual violence. The funding bump of 33 would have been a significant increase, allowing centres to hire extra counsellors to decrease wait time and enhance their services by providing much education. My question is, can the minister — she cannot hide this anymore. So what we would like to know is, will she commit today to maintaining this funding increase? The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Thanks to the member opposite for the question. I've never been accused of hiding anything in my life. So here we are today uh, talking about a very important issue, one that I have talked about extensively since I was appointed to this cabinet on June the 29th, and that is the support for women fleeing domestic violence, those who are dealing with, uh, with uh, rape, and those who are uh, being human trafficked. I've taken that seriously. I've raised these issues on the floor of the legislature, and I'm really excited that on Thursday I will have the opportunity at the Canadian Club to talk about what our government plans on doing. You know, in the previous Liberal administration, they separated gender-based violence from human trafficking, from violence against women. Under our new government, we've been able to repatriate those three major pillars so that we can have a comprehensive approach to protect the most vulnerable women in this province. And I can tell you, as an advocate for those women around the cabinet table, they will never have to worry about not being listened to or not being heard, because I will stand here and I won't hide. 
proceeds. Supplementary. So I certainly appreciate the minister's commitment to talk in this house and get some rounds of applause by our colleagues. That, I have to say, congratulations for applauding. The problem is further than this. You know, I had the great pleasure of standing with me member of this legislature on the sexual violence, on a special committee with sexual violence and harassment. We actually toured the province. We've heard very specifically of the needs. And actually, if I recall, two of your members were on this committee, and they actually advocated for increase in funding very significantly what to the to reason that? why. So again, I hear what the, the minister is saying, and with all due respect, Mr. Speaker, good. speaking here in this house doesn't provide the funding that is so much needed in the community, why in those organizations. So Question. again, I ask, why now that you're in government, are the same people who attended those meetings not fighting to ensure that those survivors are not being neglected? Mr. Thanks very much, Speaker. I had the great opportunity since being appointed to, uh, to this ministry uh, to travel across the province and visit shelters and speak with experts in the field, and I'm going to continue to do that. But, you know, it's a bit rich for the former Liberal government uh, cabinet minister to be talking about funding when they blew the budget and they compromised the very core and value of public services that the most vulnerable people who rely on my ministry need. But I'll tell you something, Speaker. I am going to continue to fund this ministry, and I'll have more to say weeks ahead, but my ministry right now spends $160 million on emergency centers, 24-hour crisis lines, counselling, safety planning, transitional housing and referral services, and court-based victim witness assistance. And I'm excited that later today I'll be meeting with the Attorney General, the Minister of Labour, and the Minister of the Community and so at Corrections so Response. we can start charting a path forward, unlike they did for 15 years. Uh Order. Order. Start the clock. The member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of en Environment on Affordability. Minister, as the weather across the province changes, I'm reminded of many conversations I had during my campaign. Constituents of my riding of Mississauga Malton told me how they dreaded this time of year. As the temperature continues to dip down, the cost associated with living goes up. People would tell me of exceptional lengths they would go to just avoid turning on the thermostat in their homes. As the weather gets colder, quick 15 minutes walk to the grocery store is no longer a viable option at 30, minus 30 degrees. Affordability of the gas for the car and heat for the home essential to our quality of life. Multiple times we heard about choosing between eating Question. and heating. Speaker, we made a commitment to make life more affordable. Can the minister provide an update on the progress? Thank you. This is the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Mississauga Malton, thank you for the question. He's quite right. Um, Premier Ford and this government made a commitment to focus on affordability. We made a focus to make sure that we put money back in people's pockets and, as the Premier said, help is on the way. And that help is almost here. Uh, the consultation on Bill 4 is concluded. We are now in the process of wrapping up the, uh, the passage of that bill. And directly tied to the decisions made in that bill, the Cap and Trade Cancellation Act, we've already seen a 4.6 cent reduction in the price of gasoline and a 5.7 cent reduction in diesel. Mr. Speaker, this past month we've seen notices from the natural gas companies, notices saying that cap and trade is no longer applied. I, I know this is true because my colleague, the Honourable Minister of Finance, shared his bill on social media Bonds. so people could see. So, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to strive around affordability. We will continue to support families. Here, here. We will continue to ensure that we meet our promises. Stop the clock. Start the clock again. Supplementary. Your response. Back to the minister. It is vital for the people of Ontario that the government must fight for them. And we must continue to fight to make life more affordable. Here, here. While we recognize these significant environmental changes, we must face this 
These can be resolved without costly taxes, taxes that make life unaffordable for the people of Ontario. The fact that the Liberal government cap and trade did little for the environment was nothing more than a revenue tool, and a revenue tool that the member of NDP want to exploit. Mr. Speaker, we heard that in the past as well. The member for Ottawa Centre has called for $150 per ton carbon tax. Shame. Can the minister, Shame. can the minister of Environment explain to this house how this tax will hurt the middle class families Question. and how much will it cost the people of Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. The member is quite correct. Um, the NDP have called for the highest carbon tax in the world. That would mean 35 cent litre increase on gasoline. Mr. Speaker, that kind of punishing carbon tax on Ontario families would cost them $216 a month. Wow. For the 73% of Ontario families who use natural gas, that would be $2,500 a year. Wow. What does the NDP have wow. against Ontario families? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we will bring forward a climate plan that does not punish Ontario families. It will make sure that we balance the economy and the environment. We will make sure that not only the cap-and-trade program, but the Liberal carbon tax is not imposed to protect Ontario families and protect our environment. Yeah. Start the clock again. The member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. The Francophone population is about 612,000 people in our province. Oh, Madam Minister, it's po not possible to vote in French in our municipal elections. La Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I um, thank the member for his question. The question of bilingualism and access to French language service is very important for our government, and I have worked a lot on it. I've had a series of roundtables throughout the province regarding this issue, and I speak, uh, I spoke uh, directly to Franco Ontarians and to Francophones uh, in, in question of uh, providing services such as when you vote. I thank him for the question, though, and we'll continue working on it. Madam Minister, the Premier showed that it's the province that manages and that he will act quickly when he wants changes uh, to the municipal elections. In Ontario, there are hundreds of uh, Francophone schools and 12 school boards, and the enrollment has increased in the French language programs. Millions of Ontarians today will vote today in the municipal elections, but 112,000 Francophones throughout the province will not have the ability to vote in their own language, which is an official language in Canada. What uh, answer will you give, Madam Minister, to the Francophones of this province who would like to vote in their own language, in French language, for their uh, school councillors, in Francophone school councillors? The minister. the minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will ask the member to ask uh, the question to the preceding government, who had 15 years to not resolve this important issue to the francophones. We t tackle issues by, and we talking directly to francophones, and working directly with her, with them, to ensure, uh, try to. Uh, answer the important issues, including the vote, the right to vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. As I'm sure the Minister is aware, starting today, members of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers are taking part in rotating strikes across the country. My constituents are concerned with what, th what this will mean for the services that they receive from our government. This job action could cause significant inconveniences for the people of Ontario who rely on Canada Post for the timely delivery of important documents like birth, marriage and death certificates. Can the Minister update the Legislature on how the Canada Post rotating strikes will impact government services in Ontario and what our government is doing about it? 
Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks for the excellent question this morning from my colleague from Thornhill. I know Ontarians are wondering what will happen to important documents that they're expecting to receive in the mail. And with the situation limited right now to rotating strikes, Service Ontario will continue to use Canada Post to deliver all documents, including birth, marriage, and death certificates, driver's licenses, and health cards. Unfortunately, though, Speaker, due to the federal government's inability to reach a deal with postal workers, Ontarians may experience delays in delivery time times and service guarantees may not be met. We give full credit to the team at Service Ontario and the Vital Certificates staff up in Thunder Bay, who I had an opportunity to meet last yeah, week. Yeah. Um, you know, those who are renewing documents during this time should keep their receipt as temporary proof of renewal. But, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you at the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services, we're keeping Spons. a very close eye on these rotating strikes and ensuring we're dealing with them as efficiently as we possibly can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his assurances and for the plan his ministry has developed. The constituents in my riding who rely on Service Ontario to receive critical government services and vital documents will be pleased to see our government is monitoring the impact the rolling strikes will have on the services they receive. Mr. Speaker, labour disputes change on a daily basis depending on how well negotiations are going. Could the minister update the legislature on the contingency plan our government has in place to ensure continued services in the event the Canadian Union of Postal Workers rolling strikes become a nationwide strike or if Canada Post undertakes a lockout? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thanks again to the member from Thornhill. Uh, we hope things don't escalate and cause a strike that would halt mail delivery right across Canada. But our government is prepared for any outcome of these negotiations. The ministry has developed a full contingency plan to protect delivery of vital documents to Ontarians in the event of a Canada post work stoppage that would infect the entire country. And uh, we will look to alternative delivery processes for these vital events documents if necessary. Those who renew documents during this time should keep their receipt as temporary proof of renewal, and we're continuing to encourage those who receive payments in the mail from the Ontario government to sign up for direct deposit as well. For more information, Ontarians can go to the website ontario.ca slash mail. And Speaker, we are ready. We are prepared. We'll ensure Ontarians continue to receive the services. Mr. Speaker, Spons. as the Boy Scouts say, be prepared, and we at MGCS are prepared today. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, after weeks and weeks of delays, the government's so-called education consultations are already off to a rocky start. On Thursday, people in northwestern Ontario were given less than 24 hours' notice of their dedicated telephone town hall. And if they somehow found out that the sign-up link was active, they had just five hours to register to participate before the cutoff deadline. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a tweet, a tweet just doesn't cut it. Mr. Speaker, does the minister think the results of this consultation will be meaningful if people aren't given fair chance to participate, or is that the point? Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, I have to say another week, a new day, and another opportunity for me to tell the member opposite that she is absolutely wrong in her yeah. assertion. On Yet alone. another phase of opportunity for people to contribute into a consultation process that we feel is comprehensive and will shape the direction of our education in the future. You know, I have the opportunity to sit in on that call, and I have to tell you, Speaker, I am really enthused by the thoughtful, the thoughtful. Here, here. literacy. People were sharing very thoughtful, proactive ideas on the use of cell phones in the classroom. Response. And you know what, what is interesting? And, Speaker, you'll smile when you hear this. People were actually talking about the need to understand what's driving GDP, and they also would like to wow. see more food literacy That's in the class. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, that is 
is just total fiction. Uh, what they are concerned about is the rollback in sex education to the last century, uh, the stopping of the Indigenous curriculum writing, and the cancellation of this year's grants to parent councils that would allow parents to engage other parents in the education of their children. It's about respect, Mr. Speaker. The scope of these consultations has only grown while the means of participating seems to be shrinking. For those very, very few who did manage to get on the Northwest Regional Town Hall, less than 15 minutes, 15 minutes were dedicated to input on the health and physical education curriculum, which is the supposed reason for the entire consultation taking place. Mr. Speaker, how can Ontarians trust the outcome of these consultations if the process is already showing such serious flaws? Members, please take their seats. Minister. <laughs> Speaker, I have to stand up and share with you that the member opposite, the member from Davenport, is working so hard to create a narrative that it's not sticking. We have three phases of our consultation. Our first phase that we introduced far surpassed the measly 1,638 people Order. that the former exactly. Liberal government reached out to. Exactly. And now we've just kicked off our telephone town halls, and we've been really pleased with the results of that town hall. And in conjunction Order. with that, we have an online survey. And I'll tell you this, people from one end of the province to another will have an opportunity to participate in that as well. And we're doing Best all points. of this because, you know what? Under the Order. last government, this province Spons. got on a very precarious road to, to absolute bankruptcy. We're respecting the taxpayer dollar and doing so in an efficient way. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. This weekend, I hosted a roundtable on human trafficking with my colleague, the MPP for Barry Springwater and Oro Medante. We were appalled to learn that Ontario is plagued by different types of human trafficking, but most notably, sex trafficking of young and, vul and vulnerable women. These are a violation of individual human rights, and it represents modern-day slavery, forcing individuals to act against their will. Traffickers control these women in many ways, including psychological manipulation, addiction, emotional abuse, and social isolation. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the House how is it acceptable that these women and girls are falling victim to sex traffickers? The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to thank the honourable member for her excellent question and for drawing this important issue onto the floor of this legislature. And I congratulate her and my colleague from Barry Springwater and Donkey for the uh, roundtable that they had this weekend on what I call Ontario's dirty little secret. I'd be remiss, however, if I did not applaud the Minister of Labour for being the number one champion in this legislature over many years after her dedication to ending human trafficking, which we saved the girl next door at. I'm really proud of the work that she has done because it is true, Speaker. 65% of human trafficking in Canada comes from the province of Ontario. And let me be perfectly clear these young women are conditioned, they are coerced, they are raped, they are addicted, and they are dehumanized. And I would say if we can't make sure that they're equal, are any of us equal? Because this is an issue that affects a lot of young women under Response. the age of 18. In fact, 70% 70 70 of sex trafficking victims are under the age of 25. Speaker, we have more to do, and I'm looking forward to talking more about it in the supplemental. I'm also looking forward to speaking to the Canadian Club this Thursday. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your response, and I'm proud to be part of a government that's taking so much action on this issue. After the roundtable uh, I held with my colleague this weekend, I did a bit more research, and I learned that uh, in, uh, in Ontario, roughly two-thirds uh, of the police reports every year are due to human trafficking. According to police reporting, uh, repre police reporting data and Statistics Canada, approximately 70 percent of sex trafficking victims are predominantly women under the age of 25, and 26 percent are under 
under the age of 18, as the minister has stated. Additionally, data shows that the majority of persons accused of human trafficking are often young males. Trends indicate that this is a growing pro problem across our province and certainly in my riding. Can the minister tell us how the government is combating sex trafficking? Minister. I, uh, I've inherited uh, five previous ministries, and I can tell you my number one priority is to continue the strong work of the Minister of Labour in this field. Yeah. And I can tell you that this is not just, um, it's not just a provincial issue, it is a community issue, it's a neighbourhood issue, it's a national issue. Our response to sex trafficking pr previously was based on four pillars, uh, prevention and community supports, Indigenous-led approaches, justice supports and provincial coordination and leadership, and I've added a fifth pillar. Uh, this past weekend, I had the opportunity to meet with all of the uh, women's issues ministers across the country and com uh, compelled them to action in creating a task force that I will co-chair on human trafficking and working with every other province and the federal government, as well as Indigenous leaders. Uh, together, we have vowed to address this issue in all forms through a new initiative uh, to combat sex trafficking, and I'm honoured, as I said, to be the co-chair for that, but I also wanted to point out that our entire government is taking this serious. That's why later today I'll meet with the Minister of Labour, the Attorney General and the Ministry of Corrections so that we can have an integrated approach to save the girl next door. We start the clock. The member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Auto insurance premiums should be based on your car and how you drive, not where you live. However, when comparing the same driver with uh, the same car in parts of Scarborough and elsewhere in the province, Residents of my community are paying as much as $1,000 more for auto insurance. Shame. Shame. This is not fair, and this must change. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why drivers in my community are being penalized for living in Scarborough? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you very much uh, for the question. It's clear that the Liberal NDP system of failed uh, auto insurance is absolutely broken, Speaker. Our government is now looking at Order. the regulatory environment surrounding auto insurance in Ontario with the potential of allowing more competition in the marketplace. The Premier made it very, very clear our government is committed to ensuring fairness in rate setting, ending discriminatory practices, and working towards a system that puts the drivers first. Speaker, I'll speak more in the supplementary, uh, where I have an opportunity to congratulate uh, our PC member from Milton for his great work on this file. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. After 15 years of liberal failure, we have a government now that can actually do something the better, but they're taking it to worse. Yeah. Rising daily expenses from auto insurance to housing are a growing burden for families across Ontario. Ending postal code discrimination in auto insurance rates is one realistic step the government can take to make life more affordable for all our families. Good drivers in Scarborough should not be paying more than good drivers elsewhere in the GTA. But unfortunately, this government has decided to put forward a bill with no teeth claiming that it will end this unfair practice. There is nothing about uh, Mr. Speaker, why is this government proposing a bill with no teeth when they have another option to support our bill that will, once and for all, end postal code discrimination in auto insurance? Minister, please, please take your seat. Minister. Speaker, I do want to uh, begin by thanking my parliamentary assistant, the member from Barry Springwater, Oral Madonte, for taking care of the insurance file. Thank you very much. You know, <clears throat> we congratulate also, as I said earlier, our PC member from Milton for his important work on this file. Speaker, his proposed uh, insurance initiative is a great way to combat rate discrimination in the auto insurance system. 
once the members le legislation is uh, or now that the members legislation is tabled we look forward to working with him and the industry stakeholders Bonds. to ensure our auto system meets the needs of Ontario's 10 million drivers thank you Thank you. Next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. <laughs> Speaker, we promised the people of Ontario that our government would create good jobs and make Ontario open for business. I know from speaking with businesses and students uh, in my writing that 15 years of liberal mismanagement has left them behind. And part of our key of delivering on our promise is ensuring that students have the skills they need to fill the jobs of tomorrow. This past Friday, I was pleased to represent you, Minister, at the announcement at the opening of the National Power Line Training Center and other infrastructure upgrades at St. Clair College Thames Campus in my hometown of Chatham. It was an exciting development for St. Clair College and as it continues to grow and providing training to students in southwestern Ontario. Can the minister tell us about the government's plans to help Ontarians find good quality jobs and get the skills they need? For training colleges and universities. Thank, thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the MPP from Chatham Kent Leamington for the question and their hard work advocating for their constituents. I'm proud of the member from Chatham-Kent, Leamington, was able to represent the government in Chatham and congratulate President Patty France and the team at St. Clair on this exciting development. Speaker, I want all Ontarians to reach their full potential. My focus as minister is to ensure that our young people have the skills they need to fill the needed jobs and build a career for themselves in their community. As the member mentions, St. Clair College has opened its new 8,000-square-foot training centre for power line technicians at its Chatham campus. This is in addition to infrastructure upgrades at the St. Clair's Windsor campus. Our government has promised the people Response. of Ontario to create good jobs and make Ontario open for business, and that's exactly what we are doing. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you, Minister, for your hard work for young people of Ontario and getting this province back on track. Speaker, the people of Chatham are excited to have a new facility to help ensure that young people in Ontario can gain the skills they need for jobs of tomorrow. At the same time, Ontarians know that as we invest in our young people's education, there is a pressing need to reduce the massive burden of provincial debt and the recent $15 billion deficit the former Liberal government hid. Unsustainable debt loads risk the future of vital public services and threaten the ability of our government to make investments in infrastructure like the one announced at St. Clair College. Speaker. Can the minister tell us more about the investment at St. Clair and the importance of returning Ontario to secure financial footing? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our government recognizes the crucial role that colleges will play to ensure that Ontarians have the skill they need. We know from talking with employers that there is a skills gap which is dragging down our economy. The new facility will help bring St. Clair College's Powerline training program to the national level. Speaker, unlike the previous Liberal government, we know that we have a responsibility to our young people to invest in their education and not to leave them with an unsustainable debt load for their children and grandchildren. I am looking forward to working with St. Clair College and all of Ontario's publicly assisted colleges to ensure we can fill the skills gap, create good jobs, and make Ontario open for business. Thank you, Speaker. Members, please take your seats. Next question, the member for Comiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Winter is coming. We've got one road, Highway 11, will inevitably be closed on numerous times and Northerners will be cut off once again. We used to have an option. It was called the Northlander passenger train. In fact, I think we all agree that there was a mistake shutting that service down. In fact, both the NDP and the Conservatives promised 
to bring that service back or bring passenger rail service back in the last election campaign. In fact, as we speak, there are community groups mobilizing as we speak to help that happen. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development Mines, when is the Ford government going to bring back passenger rail service to northeastern Ontario? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Well, Mr. Speaker, while this member has a track record of sitting on his hands for these important issues, we're moving forward with a reliable, effective, cost-efficient northern transportation strategy. There are people across the vast, uh, the vast region of northern Ontario, most of the size of Europe, Mr. Speaker, who need to be able to rely on bus services with washrooms in them to get to small towns and cities, to and from medical appointments, Mr. Speaker, safe highways to transport people and products. Railroads, Mr. Speaker, in different parts of the region that will, again, transport safely uh, people and their products, Mr. Speaker. We're working on a strategy that will be effective for all of Northern Ontario, and I look forward to that member supporting that kind of plan. Supplementary. Once again, to the Minister of Northern Development Mines, I do seem to recall that during the election campaign, a promise was made to bring passenger rail service back to northeastern Ontario. It was made by the NDP and it was made by the Conservatives, That's right. including, I believe, the Premier, yes. to bring passenger rail back. We're great looking at the whole system, but a specific commitment was made. Specific people are being cut off. And I also remember, I distinctly remember, you guys have a slogan. You guys have a slogan. You can help me with it. Yeah. Promise made, but in the case of Northerners, it's more like promise maybe. maybe. Promise maybe. Once again, Minister, will you or will you not work with the NDP, work with Northerners to bring back passenger rail service to northeastern Ontario? Minister, I guess I guess he'll huff and he'll puff, Mr. Speaker. But here's the promise that we made: it was to respect taxpayers' dollar. Because underpinning every question in this place is the NDP's complete disrespect for the structural deficits and debt that this province has. Mr. Speaker, it's like they're normalizing debt. Wait a second, colleagues. There this is the normalizing debt party. I'm there. I've landed, Mr. Speaker. Through you to my colleagues, should my eternal quest to understand what the NDP stand for stop here with this discovery? No. I'll continue the fight then, Mr. Speaker. But there isn't a family or a small business in this province who would operate their financial affairs like they would propose, and the, the independent people sitting down the way, Mr. Speaker, Speaker have run this province. Thank you. That concludes our time for question period this morning. We have a deferred vote. Oh, the Deputy Premier on a point of order. Yeah. To correct my record, please, in my answer to the question concerning consumption and treatment services, I indicated that the total cost was $331 million. In fact, it's $31.3 million. Thank you very much. We have a deferred vote. It's a motion for allocation of time on government notice, government order number four regarding amendments to the standing orders. Call in the members. This is a five minute bell.
Members, please take their seats. On October the 18th, 2018, Mr. Bethenfalvi moved the government notice of motion number 12. All those in favour of Mr. Bethenfalvi's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Bethenfalvi. Mr. Bethenfalvi. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Mulroney. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tobolo. Mr. Tobolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Trantifalopoulos. Mr. Trantifalopoulos. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mademoiselle Samar. Mademoiselle Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith Peterborough Coorth. Mr. Smith Peterborough Coorth. Mr. McKenna. Mr. McKenna. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tani Gaslam. Mr. Tani Gaslam. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Smith. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natashat. Mr. Natashat. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Manta. Mr. Manta. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Shriner. Mr. Shriner. The ayes are 69, the nays are 34. The ayes being 69 and the nays being 34, I declare the motion carried. <laughs> Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, and a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to just rise and offer congratulations on behalf of the House to the member from Burlington, Ms. McKenna, on her birthday today. Hey! Happy birthday! Minister of Education on a point of order. I'd like to stand in this house and share sincere congratulations to my PA, Sam Osterhoff, for popping the question, and she said yes. Hey! Point of order, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We too have someone who is celebrating a special birth birthday today, Ms. Sandy Shaw from Hamilton West Ancaster Dundas. Whoa.
This House stands in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.